OK, here we go. So uh, comrades don't Soviet. Uh, how goes it? Uh, it's um, it's uh, going all it's uh, going all right. It's great to great to be speaking with you, comrade. Uh, nice to uh, bring out the um, to bring out to the to the people a little more about yourself because you you you're an important figure to what we're trying to build here. But a lot of people don't fully understand what it is you're about. Mm. Well, you know, what I went through to, to be me, you know, like is pretty sort of original, you know, because I'm just, you know, from a family, refugee, uh, Jewish family, you know, from Poland, whose families, you know, never had any uh, university education. I ended up, you know, doing my PhD in political science at the University of Quebec in Montreal because of the necessity of doing so, because I've been an activist, you know, since forever sort of thing. Since my mother was an activist, you know, in Poland, in Warsaw, and escaped from the Warsaw Ghetto, and her mother was a partisan as well. Uh, her brother, yeah, my mother, you know, so it's a sort of a pretty solid background, you know, to be thinking in ter activist terms, you know. The which Warsaw Ghetto sort of Uprising was probably one of the most beautiful show of how strong Polish struggle against fascism and Jewish struggle against fascism had stuck out until, you know, you know all the way through the war, deep into the war, it, 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 it stuck out. Warsaw would not Ball, no matter how much the allies left it behind. Yeah, but yeah, but uh, the the point I was making is that you know I was an activist, you know, before I was an academic, you know, I became an academic in order to be an activist because I realized, you know, that there was, you know, there was a cliff there, you know, that we didn't know, you know, what went beyond, you know, we had to figure it out, you know, for ourselves and build it at the same time. So you know that's why I went into you know political theory, international relations, constitutional law, <clears throat> political philosophy, and all that, you know, to build up the uh, alternative, you know, to a nation state. And uh, I applied it to Palestine in terms of the uh, Hebrew nation that is settled there, which can be accommodated by the Palestinians. And so <clears throat> and when I was writing in Nablus, you know, I wrote a book as well, you know, because activism and, you know, writing, you know, to me, you know, go together because, you know, I'm talking with people all the time, you know, that I'm working with <clears throat> and they tell me, you know, what they want. And so, you know, I figure out how to reconcile that, you know, with uh, with the Jewish national liberation without being Zionist type of thing. So that's, you know, why I developed the application of the national cultural autonomy from the Bund to the Hebrew nation that exists there right now that are called, you know, the Israelis, the Jewish Israelis. And so they become, you know, autonomous in a federation with the Palestinians and they share the territory in that way. And then all land disputes have to be regulated by a trilateral commission, et cetera, et cetera. And then you have constitutional assemblies, you know, to develop a federal council. You know, it's all possible. You know, it's logical and it's possible and there's historical precedence, you know. So the, that's how I apply, you know, and become an activist and an academic, you know, at the same time. It's really necessary. I would Look encourage other like, people to go into studies. I guess it looks at a very much important tie as well between religiosity and culture. And I, do you know what? It was that important tie that your um your your discussion on cultural um autonomy made me un come to the realization that i feel like local cultural authority which i guess the constitutional assemblies is really what you're getting into there anyway local cultural authority yeah, within a national uh, cultural autonomy is massively important so that power is displaced amongst the people essentially yeah it's like a lego thing you know like a federation of federations and develops, you know, like a to to any degree necessary, and then uh, the coordination is done by delegates, you know, recallable, you know, who honor uh, speak, you know, for the uh, consensus of opinion from who they represent, you know, on a rotating basis, et cetera, et cetera. It's always possible, yeah. You know, like one time, you know, I ran into uh, 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 what is that guy? You know, the the Christian liberation guy, you know, in the United States, who gets a lot of, you know, media. Uh, Chris Hedges. Um, oh, yeah, Chris oh. Hedges. So uh, I was at an academic congress, you know, in Canada one time, and he was the lead speaker at like 7.30 in the morning or something. So I went, actually. And then, <laughs> you know, it was filled with people, you know, like 300 people in this hall, you know, to hear yeah, this guy. But, you know? like, okay, I got so, respect for that. Turned it up at 7.30 yeah. in the morning. Fuck it up. Yeah. So, you know, I got to ask a question, and I said, you know, like, what was his opinion about direct democracy? 
He said, oh, it doesn't work, you know, like it's been shown that it doesn't go, work for more than 500 people, you know, like in any, any given meeting. And I said, well, you know, like 500 people, that's a lot, you know, like, you know, you know, like, you know, and I sort of screech practically uh, uh, in a very sort of, you know, stressed tone, you know, I said, you know, like, what about, you know, like Prudhomme's, you know, Federation of Federations? And then he had no answer because he probably didn't even know who Prudhomme was. And uh, <laughs> all the academics, you know, were silent, you know, like, you know, a bit of attention, you know, so I said, okay, okay, you know, like, I'll leave it at that, you know, like, I'm not going to bother you anymore. <laughs> You're already dragging him for a month enough. <laughs> I am a troublemaker. I, you know, like, I just, you know, like, answer, ask the necessary questions and not, you know, the cliches. I'm so tired of cliche questions and stuff like that. It was the idiocy of his answer. I feel that people have forgotten how much 500 people is. It's a lot of people just because a million people is more. I, I, I'd like to go to like the way that Islam looks. So they say that one life is worth. I can't remember if it's a thousand, a million or, or it's a massive number. But essentially one life is worth a very large chunk of life because we, we our value of human life has become so individualistic that we just then count every individual life as a separate capacitative to life rather than looking at us as communal people that work together or well, 500 mm. people organizing society well that's a that's a district of a town easily you know like yeah, that's a whole neighborhood you know yeah in, in Havana they have a 20,000 uh, um, uh, revolutionary defense committees I think they're called 20,000 in Havana alone, you know. So when I was visiting one time in Cuba, uh, and, uh, you know, the academics, you know, were in a presentation from Cuba, probably from the Communist Party as well. And they said, you can ask us anything, okay? So I said, well, you've got these 20,000, you know, revolutionary defense committees, you know, in Havana. How come they don't, you know, form a Soviet? You know, and, uh, you know, be autonomous, you know, from the state. And you build up, you know, like this, you know, throughout the whole country, you know, with constitutional assembly and everything with representation from all of these you know like councils municipal councils etc cetera, etc cetera. and they said oh no 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 they started laughing you know in unison <laughs> so and they wouldn't even answer you know they just dismissed the question entirely so then after oh, that wow. i figured you know like it was pretty useless it's there um I guess this comes into like cognitive dissonance and how people like to dodge the most difficult aspect of uh, intellectual thought, which is criticism. Mm. I don't know. Yeah, it's sort of a circle, circle logic. You know, everything justifies itself. There's no way out of the circle. Exactly. So mm. every, everything you have has like a every every good answer you have for summer that is a logical thing that we could definitely do. They always mm. have some like sly, cocky answer that you'd expect from a child that is trying to get out of trying to do a chore or something like it's almost <laughs> it's, it, it's almost pathetic, but you can't deal with it like that because you'll never get anywhere with them. But it almost seems like you get nowhere with them anyway. So it's hard to hopscotch it. Well, in political theory, that's called a uh, tautological. I mean, circular thinking that it's uh, an argument that's trying to rationalize itself. I like the diagram. Yeah. Oh, my. So. So I've gone to uh, a lot of extremes, you know, in my political activism as well, you know, because. I, you know, I'm, I'm sort of, you know, like so concerned, you know, with trying to smash the the remains, you know, of fascism and turn it into a corpse that uh, prevent its resurgence. That uh, I've always, you know, like been on the offensive, you know, especially, you know, like, for example, you know, in grade six, you know, I had this primary school teacher at the King Edward public school. Imagine, you know, King Edward, <clears throat> one of these imperial, you know, monarchs. And there he is, you know, right there and, you know, in, the, in our neighborhood. And so, you know, this teacher, you know, Mr. Gardner, you know, he's talking to the class about some scientific thing you know, or other. And he just sort of, you know, interjects, you know, out of the blue that the Jews killed Christian babies in the Middle Ages. So I freaked out on them and stood up, you know, without permission and pointed to him and yelled, you know, basically, you're a liar. You're a liar, you know, like emphasizing the you're. I mean, half of these royals are German. 
I mean, English oh, were doing yeah. horrible things to the Jews around this time as well. But I want to remind it's people where German the term, yeah. because well, because idiotic American comedies has made people think it comes from Central Asia this term, but it doesn't. It comes from doesn't come from Kazakhstan. It comes from Germany, and the term "throw the Jew down the well." That comes from when they were chucking them down wells during the Black Death. If anyone has been doing anything to anyone, it was Protestants and Catholics murdering Jews, not the other fucking way around. Oh, so they the can, they can get out of there with their bullshit. Well, yeah, the first crusade came from France. The yep. Frank, uh, the, and, uh, you know, they wanted to become an empire, so they sent, you know, a whole bunch of soldiers down to occupy Jerusalem. And on the way, you know, like occupy everywhere else. But on the pretext that they were going to Jerusalem. <laughs> And also on the way, you know, like murdering as many Jewish uh, people as they could. So it's, it was, you know, like the, the crusade started in Europe, you know, it didn't start, you know, like in the Middle East. And then, you know, no. it was German with the, uh, what are they called, the Templars. The Templars was another crusade. Well, there's actually a rise of a group called the Knights Templar in Britain that's trying to return fascism um, oh, yeah. <laughs> really correctly. There are, it's run by an Ulster Scot who supports Northern Ireland. Uh-huh. Oh. Jim Dyson. Oh, yeah, Northern Ireland. Oh, that was a big struggle. I went through a lot. Yeah, yeah. That. That, is, that is a, you know, like, Northern Ireland was somewhat like, almost like the pattern for um, what would soon become apartheid. It was the start of it. Mm-hmm. And, and the, the one thing as well that I went against is, so slavery, uh, modern history tries to, like, not in schools, I mean like the common consensus that comes from people just from a typical thought. They seem to think that slavery was started from a mistake of us not understanding black people. We, we've known about black people for fucking way longer than we were ever calling people white or black. We've been connected to Africa for millennia. I mean, uh, you know, there's pottery that's found in Britain from the third and fourth century that comes from bloody Jerusalem. Do I need to say any more? Like, it genuinely, it's ridiculous. Like these people seem to think this of Jewish people, of African people, that there's just this mistake that because they look different that we oppress them. It's because we used whatever excuse we could to make them to be different to oppress them. It was all about class poisoning society because every time, like if we look at the Abrahamic faith, for example, every time a new sector of the Abrahamic faith rose up, it always tried to rose up in a very tribal socialistic principle. And it was always corrupted by class. Class always come in and smashed whatever it was trying to do. Whatever animosity any Marxist or any other dickhead has for a religion, I couldn't really care because, you know, I'm an agnostic Catholic myself. And as far as I'm concerned, I see that there is a cultural basis for tribal socialism. With And I, when I say tribal, I mean tribal as in the traditional sense of nation, not as in a, 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 a sense of historical yeah, irrelevance. Yeah because I hate the way that tribal is used in a disrespecting math. And it really drives me up the wall with the way that white middle-class people seem to think that tribalism is some backwards thing when tribalism is the true sense of nation. It's nation without the nation state. And they're, um, I lost my old thought. <laughs> I was on a really good point then. Yeah, the the uh, yeah tribal socialism within religiosity, uh, you know these these cultures developed to try and correct wrongs that they thought were occurring. I mean, Ethiopia was the start of Christianity. A lot of people don't know that, and it, they started Christianity when Christ was was uh, in sanctuary there, running from uh, the Romans. Um, Ethiopia also gave sanctuary to the Prophet Muhammad when he was in struggle, and huh? you know. I think Islam is actually a really good example as much as Christianity is something we can talk hours for on it. So, I mean, look at the rise of, look at the rise of the, well, look at the rise of the sanctuary in Ethiopia. Did you know that? Oh, I didn't know that actually. No way. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) God, that's amazing. I remember listening to Kwame Ture talk about it, uh, about the other guys. I didn't, he didn't mention Moses. I wish he'd mentioned Moses. That'd have been fiery because then, he was talking about um, what's it, the relativity between the, the, the Abrahamic faith and the African people and how all their struggles are tied to the African people because the Zionists well, was There was an incident, you know, like uh, which it denotes that, you know, uh, because when I was working with uh, some Africans, you know, uh, uh, setting up, you know, like a, 
uh, a nonprofit kitchen at our uh, cultural center. Um, and, uh, you know, they were playing some music, you know, like in one song, you know, I was talking continually about, you know, like, um, Aruna, Aruna, Aruna. And I said, you know, like, uh, you know, like, that sounds like, you know, the, the Hebrew word that I learned, you know, for the name of God, one of the names of God. And, uh, and I said, so, you know, what does that the word mean in, uh, in Wolof, you know, the language of Senegal? He said, oh, it means it's, an, it's the word for life. So that's you know, like, so beautiful, isn't it? You know, so Hebrew adopted the, the the word for life in one of the African languages. You know that they came across, you know, through the migrations, and used it to mean, you know, the the name of the uh, all all inclusive, you know, deity or something like that. Well, I mean, if you think about it, doesn't this really incorporate the balance between agnostic and 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 uh, what's it uh, non agnostic yeah. religious yeah. folk? Because it really entwines because and, and not as a non agnostic person, I would see the representation of God as the representation of all things that exist, and and I am open to things being proved further because if they exist, like this is why I hate about like vulgar materialists. If he's proven to exist, he's a material thing. You can't measure him. He's beyond that capacity, but he's still material. He exists. Precisely. He may be. The argument of, the, of whether or not, you know, a deity exists, you know, is, is a moot question, you know, because you cannot prove it one way or the other. So you have to abandon the question in the first principle. You have to still respect, though, that people people have the love and belief for it as well, because people that don't respect that are, are stunned. Religion is a culture, you know, like that includes a lot of things, you know, and... Uh, and it operates by way of metaphors. You know, it's, you know, not literal, you know, it's metaphoric. For instance, you know, I can prove it as, as well, you know, because in, the, in the Genesis, you know, when it talks about the creation of the universe, okay, that's similar to the Big Bang, you know, like, so it's a primordial astrological, you know, theory of the universe. And this is, you know, considered to be, you know, like the deity or the work of the deity, okay? So there's some sort of intuitive logic to it, you know, that you can sort of, you know, see. So it's talking about a beginning of the universe. And then it talks about the creation of light, you know, on the first day, even though, you know, there was no day that existed yet because the earth had not yet existed because the earth was created on the second day. So that proves that's it, that it's metaphorical. But also, that- also a thing to point out as well is that days are not the same measurement that we would use at that point in time because our rotation around the sun that we've decided to base our days off is not what God could be basing his days off. They could be fucking billions of years for all we know. And it, was not, and it was not always the same thing either, you know, it evolved. So, uh, you know, it's, it, that demonstrates, you know, how the text is all metaphorical and is written by human, not written by the deity. So, it's a thing as well. <laughs> so, 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 like, history, and also so, at the age of 14, you know, I couldn't accept, you know, the... Uh, the idea of, you know, being loyal to the deity, you know, because the deity wasn't loyal to us and abandoned us. You know, there's a joke that, that demonstrates this, you know, that comes from a resistance movie, like I'm going to tell it to you now. Okay, there's uh, these two Jewish guys, you know, you know, in heaven, sitting there talking to each other. And one guy, you know, like he was from Treblinka, you know, death camp. And the other guy, he was from the Medanic death camp. And the first guy, you know, like says, uh, you know, was arguing, you know, like why his camp was so much worse than the than the uh, than the one of the other guy, you know. And the other guy, you know, like he in in response, you know, was arguing, you know, like how his camp was so much worse than you know, like the previous guy's camp. So then, oh, you know, like, like God comes into you know, like this, you know, and steps in and says, you know, like gentlemen, you know, like relax, you know, like just rest in peace. And so then the first guy, you know, says, excuse me, but you weren't in either one. Or the other, so you don't have a voice in this matter. You know, leave us alone. <laughs> Fucking hell, that's savage. That is. I bet that ruffled a lot of feathers. Insolent, very insolent. You know, I I was famous for insolence in high school. I got suspended from my high school for that. As I, was told. <laughs> I used I to get suspended a lot from school because what's it? You know, it, it, a lot of the time it ends up being an outlet. Other times. You know, because of my very aggressive upbringing, I was very aggressive at dealing with a lot of issues too. So, where's all I let my insolence come from? <laughs> yeah. Oh well. Oh well. Yeah. So I wanted to add, you know, before, you know, when I went to Ottawa to work at the um, embassy, you know, to help stop the war, basically, you know, start, you know, writing things, you know, so that people in North America could understand what the Palestinians were talking about. And then, you know, the massacre took place in Sabra Shatila camps, and I. 
three months to write, you know, the book, you know, documentary, you know, study proving, you know, that the Israel military, you know, like, was responsible for the massacre and uh, helped organize it, you know, and all that, and I give all the, you know, proof, you know, and then, you know, at the same time, you know, like I was sleeping at the peace camp, uh, you know, uh, you know, squatting on Parliament Hill in front of the Parliament building, you know, in Ottawa against the U.S. cruise missile, which the government, you know, the Liberal Party government was uh, trying to conceal, you know, with the secret military treaty with the United States, you know, which was contrary to a constitutional law in Canada, because any sort of, you know, like treaty with a foreign power has to be passed by the House of Commons. But no, they just kept it secret and they didn't bother. <laughs> it was a big scandal, you know, we exposed it and stepped right into it, you know, and, and made them pay for it. And eventually, you know, I think the tests were stopped because they wanted to use it, you know, to have the capacity to go in uh, freezing temperatures over the North Pole to be able to shoot a cruise missile uh, into the northern uh, Soviet Union at the time. That was 1982, 83, 83 to 85, you know. I lived at the peace camp there for eight months myself. And eventually, you know, went back and got arrested, you know, like, I did prison time. Yeah, we should, we could do a whole story, you know, video about, you know, prison. Prison time that would each. be a great discussion because that experience is some of the a lot of people that have the title PhD have not had to go for it. <laughs> no, the PhD is they're allergic, you know, to the prison time because if you have a prison record, no university will hire you to teach, you know, for one reason. Yeah, and then in you, case over. Riots, you know, the, the boycott, you know, of anti Zionists, you know, especially if you're a Jewish anti Zionist, you know. They don't you want to have you around. You know, most uh, political science departments are still liberal, you know, right lip, you know, bullshit. So, I mean, the, the thing that would be sort of to say as well is given the experience is probably the, you know, is the driver of genuine knowledge. You would, wouldn't it be safe to argue as well that going through that arduous prison time, just all it did was solidify you because it gave you it gave you a, a punishing experience that made you feel that you were in the right for what you were doing because you're being punished by the 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 military police of Canada. No, 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 it's better than that, you know, because when you're in prison, the way I felt is, you know, like, not, you know, like how hard this is, you know, and how terrible, you know, and, and how miserable and how depressing. No, I didn't feel that way. You know, I felt like, wow, they consider me such a threat as as this that they actually have to put me in prison, you know? And that's, you know, the, it was conservative party government, you know, at the time that put me in prison, you know, during an election <laughs> campaign, you know? It's, and so, you know, I said, wow, you know, like, I'm, I'm that, you know, like, like uh, significant? Well, then let's use it, you know? So when, um, you know, they started doing the tests again in uh, January 15th, usually was the time. I went on a hunger strike when I was in prison. And I, you know, uh, you know, we had access to a telephone, you know, because it was, you know, a political right that was won, you know, a few years previously, you know, so prisoners could have access to a telephone. Previously, you, you couldn't. <laughs> yeah, you were locked up and not able to speak with you the outside world. You were dead, you know, like dead to, to, to the mouth. Okay, so I was able to get, a, you know, put together a list of all the media in the city. And I would call up all the media and I told them I was going on a hunger strike, you know, against the beginning, you know, the re uh, beginning of the, uh, you know, cruise missile tests. So, you know, they started, you know, broadcasting all across the country, you know, that these cruise missile tests was happening and that there was this activist who was on a hunger strike. And this went on for, you know, like one week. And then it went on for, you know, like another week. And then finally, you know, the administration of the uh, prison, you know, like they were getting very upset with me. And uh, they, they figured out, you know, that I was using the salt in the meals to mix into the water so that I would be able to retain the, the, the water, you know, when I was drinking water, but not eating. And if you don't have the salt, then you can't retain the water because we're basically sea creatures who have learned to breathe air. So um, they took the, 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 the salt away from me so that I was dehydrating. And it was the wintertime, it was cold, and I only had a t-shirt, you know, like on. And they wouldn't even yeah. give me another t-shirt, you know. So, you know, now it's on the wall, you know, where the wind was blowing against, you know, so if I put my hand on the wall, my hand turned purple. And, uh, you know, it was getting tough. And the lawyer came to see me and I told him the conditions and he went to court, applied for a habeas corpus and I got released. I walked out of the prison. That was tough. So I was uh, dehydrating without salt for five days. That wow. was hardcore shit. I mean, 
five days without water is is actually you know you've gone past what most people would take before they're even you know out of it it's normally three to five days for water you know seven days for food yeah oh yeah food yeah food was uh you know the thing that was tough about it was that it was in the winter time you know like the you know the first nations people that i've spoken to you know and told about that particular fast they told me that in the winter time you know in the cold you know like a fast of that duration counts double yeah because of the heat that you lose yeah you burn so much energy in this in the winter time you need to eat twice as much calories if it's as cold as it is in in, in certain parts of canada you know and you're up in the really icy yeah. regions well but you know like i developed this side like, feeling you know that i'm willing to even die you know like if that's what it means you know if they're if you know they're, they're willing to let me die you know like revolutionary uh, suicide yeah you can you get that feeling you know especially in prison you know it's a real feeling and it's a logical feeling too <laughs> you, went, you, had your, you had your george jackson moment that's what i would put it at and it, yeah. it, you know when he you know when he did his jailbreak he tried to save those people from from prison and got shot in the process oh that's that's you know like it that that risk of your life for for a movement that, that's you know bigger than your own bigger than your own uh plight as an individual yeah so, george yeah, jackson yeah. is the but the biggest symbol to that and it's like it got love and respect and i got love and respect for, for you for what you've done in that as well because anyone who goes through that struggle is a absolute legend yeah, it's, it's a matter of what's intolerable, you know, like when I'm in Palestine in front of the soldiers, you know, they're trying to push back a demonstration or shoot back a demonstration. They don't push like here, you know, with shields and, uh, you know, they use a lot of tear gas and they use uh, um, rubber bullets, you know, not even sticks. They don't bother with sticks. No way. They don't get that close. They use rubber yeah. bullets and they shoot into vulnerable areas, you know, even though they shoot into your eye, you know, <laughs> if they feel like it. If they're rubber to. bullets ain't no soft hitter anyway. Oh. Like there's a big problem with rubber bullets in the way that they use. I have a, I yeah. have one here. I brought it back from Palestine. This is what it looks like. Do you see this? Uh, I cannot see. Your camera's not on. Yes, it was on. No, it is. There we go. Ah. Oh, I yeah, need not. To turn it on a second time. No, it's not. It, it's not. It's it, yeah. It it did the glitch thing that Skype can do sometimes. Uh, but it's working now. That. Okay. That looks like it absolutely bloody punk when it hits. Yeah. And don't they even have don't they even have sizes that are even bigger than that as well that they fire at people? I haven't seen like, those. But these are pretty heavy, you know. So I once shaved off all the uh, rubber to see, you know, how big the metal was inside, and it's pretty big, you know, it, like about three quarters of space. I, you know, and and to be honest, even if there was the recoil in space, you're being hit by rubber that has mass behind it, so it's going to have a slap effect when it hits you and then pops in. Momentum, so that, yeah, that will yeah. that that can slash very that. high velocity yeah oh yeah there was I a woman the who got hit in the arm so during the protest the guy the guy who got his biceps shot out one of the things he was doing before he did that is he was helping a woman who got shot in the arm and her arm wow. got lacerated because of the rubber bullet wow. wow i got hit i was at a demonstration one time doing video you know and i wasn't paying attention to the soldiers i thought they were going to leave me alone because i was obviously a journalist and so the guy uh, hit me with a rubber bullet right in the uh, lower calf on the bone. It hit right on the bone. You know, I was stationary and he aimed for the bone. And he figured, you know, it would break the bone. And what it did is it blasted, you know, a hole the size of that rubber bullet through the skin right down to the bone, you know. And so I didn't even feel that at first, you know, because there was no nerve there, you know. So I'm going back to the demonstration, you know, like, and I knew I was hit, you know, I, I felt a tremor and I have it on video, but, uh, you know, like uh, it was, you know, a friend, you know, who asked to look at it, you know, and we discovered this hole. <laughs> so I went to the ambulance. 
it was like, yeah, I was walking back and I just found this hole in my leg. <laughs> <laughs> yeah portable, portable ashtray <laughs> yeah so I mean like right. you know like each soldier that shoots like that is ordered to do so by an officer who's standing up and looking you know and decides they look, what to do it. they look for press people I mean I, I, yeah. even with the real bullets when they're shooting protesters at the um, you know the, 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 the peace festival that Palestine does every year the, the, com oh. the coming back um <laughs> Right over I can't festival. remember. Th that's it. That's it. The bear return. It's a oh. today is the uh, 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 international day of uh, uh, commemoration for Palestine, United Nations International Day, November 29th, because of the uh, partition resolution that was passed uh, on this day by the General Assembly. Well, my 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 love and solidarity to the people in Palestine, people in Lebanon. And the people of the people of the dispersed Palestinian people that are millions mm. strong. I have confidence in Palestinian people, you know, like I think that they have the will, determination and the intellect, you know, to be able to succeed. And the Zionists, you know, are just uh, caught in a uh, whirlpool that will go down the drain. You know, they'll have to wake up and realize that they're living, you know, as neighbors. <laughs> And then no wall will separate you, no matter how high. I mean, the, the, this wall. They, they, I was thinking you know, how ridiculous it is, you know, like because I was looking at you know an image from space of of the Earth, you know, from on the cover of my book on the Federation, and you know the whole Eastern Hemisphere is the Third World, right? And the other half of the uh, of the globe is you know basically the first world and its colonies, you know, in, in South America. It's, so if a wall is, you know, like what's necessary to separate, you know, the good from the bad, why not build a wall all the way around the earth that separates, you know, the, the Eastern Hemisphere from the Western Hemisphere and be done with them, you know, like tell them to get lost. I feel the dynamic has shifted more back to the old North and South again. I feel that's an issue we're having now because it seems more like it's South America, Africa, and South Asia that's been oppressed by America, Canada, the UK, France, Germany, Russia, and China. Because Russia, Russia and China yeah, are playing some big like players Russia. now. Yeah, and yeah, that breaks it down. Yeah, that breaks it down better. But, but, but no, but like I, absolutely to what you're saying though, like it, it the North has, has just bastardized the world for centuries because what, what communism has done is it, it did bring greatness to the East, but I think a lot of people have forgotten that uh, the East has a, a big history of Romanism itself. I mean, during the era of Jesus Christ, China was in a weird settler colonial situation of warlord uh, mischievery and, and um, uh, Romanistic developments. And they actually based their empire that come, uh, what's I, I don't know whether they based it off the Byzantine Empire or specifically the Roman Empire, but uh, confusion, but their empire that they built uh, after the Roman collapse, uh, uh -huh. I'm not very good on dates. Uh, yeah, I'm not it? into history. Uh, I'm into political theory myself. But uh, China was also an industrial power at one point before the British occupation. You know that's why China is called China. You know for dishes. Yeah, so it was originally you know made in China, and then yeah. it was taken away by uh, by Britain. Yeah, a lot of people forget about what Britain did to China. Like they said, and what's it? I would argue that's why we've seen a lot of British antics with the rise of Chinese imperialism. Because, like, think about their workshop of the world method. That was the exact way that Britain got to an imperial state, and that was also the same way that America got to an imperial state. Um, America did it very mischievously because they supported the Nazis both east and west, so that they could destroy Europe and then become their sugar daddy for military equipment. Um, Who did that? Who did that? I didn't follow that. The USA. Oh, uh -huh. well, the US had economic relations with Nazi Germany, you know, right until the end. Yeah, they, you know, even paid compensation for having bombed the Ford factory. At, uh, yes, <laughs> and Ford won the fucking lawsuit. Yeah. All right. All right. <laughs> Long live private property. Right. Fucking hell, yeah. That's the way it is with these people. They 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 quite literally worship it like it is the Lord above them. But 
I, if they're to read anything that Jesus Christ ever said, considering that they mention him every five seconds and seem to draw him like a European, even though he never went to Europe. Um, what's it? Never, never touched foot on the ground in Europe. Jesus Christ, everything he's ever said, has never supported capitalism and could never support capitalism. And if they really think that their their hoxy poxy uh, uh, plastic it's plastic version of Christianity that has no content to it is going to keep all these people they've got under control, they need to remember one thing that I've always loved from from Bob Marley's song, uh, "Get Up, Stand Up." You can fool some people sometimes, but you can't fool all the people all the time. Um, I was thinking of uh, so, a remark you made just previous to that. Um, that is, you know, like a, I think what's appreciated by by many people in the in the, the life of uh, Jesus Christ, who whose name, you know, like I figured out is Yahushua ben Yusuf, uh, um, is that he, you know, like a spoke in a prophetic tradition. In the, in the Judaism, there's this thing called prophetic tradition in which prophets, you know, otherwise known as rebels, speak out against the, you know, prevailing authority to criticize it publicly. This is called the prophetic tradition, you know, it's very political. So this is, you know, like what was picked up, you know, like, uh, by, yeah, so this is a, the Jesus thing, you know, like it, it fits into all of that, you know, so that's why I think there's some uh, veracity and validity to it, you know, so. Uh, rather than sort of, you know, playing with, you know, the historical record to see, you know, what proves what. But the same thing, you know, like with the, the presence, you know, the ancient Israelites. Uh, I mean, it's, uh, you know, I, I, I can't, you know, like uh, accept, you know, um, that so many um, uh, people in solidarity with the Palestinians are trying to justify their solidarity by arguing that the uh, Jewish people never had any connection, you know, with uh, uh, with the ancient uh, land in the Canaan, you know, with the kingdoms of uh, David and Solomon. And, you know, one could talk about how they're exaggerated and all that and, and how they weren't even nation states. They were multinational societies, you know, especially in the case of Solomon. In any case, both of them come, you know, from a Moabite, you know, grandmother. So, you know, like, you know, <laughs> what are they trying to build out of nothing? You know, it's, it's you know, it's all fake. I mean, they never stopped having that connection. What about the tribe of Joseph? They never left. Actually, Israel is crushing them now. The tribe of Joseph in Ethiopia, I mean, what the, do you mean? The the tribe of Joseph still exists within Israel. I remember that talking to me about it. I can't oh, remember you, them. You mean the Samaritans? The Samaritans, mm. you know, they, they didn't consider themselves part of the kingdom of Israel. They were... In Samaria, you know, they lived in the north. They were in a different, you know, they didn't ex accept the authority of a king. But and they, so they still, lived they, and they still but, exist. But there. I would still say that that's still the Jewish connection to the land, easily proven. Like anyone that yeah. wants to try and disclose it, well, the Jews never left Syria. Yeah, uh, and they transformed into, you know, Christian Palestinians and Muslim Palestinians and such, you know, as well. Yeah, it's know. a united land of the Abrahamic faith. That's the way I always see it. It's like it's it's yeah. transformed into this sort of beautiful bastion of of, of um, what everyone agrees on is God within the Abrahamic faith. Everyone agrees to the same God. I mean, it's, it's just uh, a delineation. That's where there's a problem. That's where there's a problem because the uh, Christian religion, uh, church, not religion, but the Christian church, has developed a, a doctrine which is uh, contrary to Judaism and contrary to Islam. And that's one of the ideological motivations for the crusade. I, 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 yeah, I'd say that this is one of the, the, the developments of Romanism and how it changed Western Christianity into a, uh, a palace. Because this is where the East and Western divide does come into what you were talking about earlier with Christianity. Orthodox, yeah. uh, well, not just Orthodox, the Byzantium, the Byzantium order of Christianity. And I would very much like to look at the Assyrian side of Orthodoxy as a very good example, but also Ethiopian Orthodoxy. These people are very true to Christians and they interact very well with Islam. What I would argue is that the way to solve this issue is not only does there need to be a reunification of the church into one church again, but it needs to be on the basis that Roman 
Islam is being smacked out for Greco-Romanic Christianity because it is much more attuned to the natural order well, of Christianity. Roman religion is entirely different from Christianity. That was developed by the dynasty. I saw a documentary on this a dynasty of uh, Roman emperors from the uh, family called the uh, Flavian uh, you know, dynasty. And they developed, you know, they rewrote, you know, the uh, the Gospels, you know, to fit into their own narrative and to justify their own rule. And they inserted stuff, you know, like being subservient to authority and all that sort of stuff. So they constructed a, you know, uh, a religious justification, you know, for their empire in that way. But that uh, didn't include the business. This is where you also see the conflict between the Celts and the Saxons as well, because the Saxons wanted to adopt this Romanistic Catholicism, where oh. it's been revised. And the Celts were not up for that. I mean, there's, if you looked at any any divisive land within the Celtic regions, pretty much every name translates to land of the common people. Uh, uh -huh. They wanted a society for everyone. And that's why you have like a rise of King Arthur. Now, I have had King Arthur described to me as not a king, but kind of a king. So that means that he's more of a traditional king. He's a kingsman oh, in the yes, sense that uh, he is a he is a mm -hmm. leader of his people as yeah. by just natural order, which you know it, as it a deity, takes to show a society. A deity, yeah, no. I have some references in my doctoral thesis about that in, in the early societies in which the ruler uh, was uh, entered into a into a pact, you know, with civil society, you know. And, and it said, you know, said stuff, you know, like that the, the king has to swear an oath, you know, that he will serve the interests of the civil society. And if he doesn't uh, continue to do so, then civil society has a, has a right to revoke him from being the king. You know, right. and it's an oath. And that, and that's where it is. Democracy, it's democracy. They can't talk, call it anything else. These people don't understand how much humanity has wanted to be democratic. But the Greeks and the Romans calling themselves yeah. democracies have done yeah. nothing but torment these people. Yeah, yeah, it's democracy for the aristocrats. <laughs> that's what it is. <laughs> that's why it's called the Senate. You know, it's the Senate. Like the you know, like United States is called the Senate too. You know, like everywhere, it's called the Senate. Why? Because that's what they call it in Rome. You know, we changed it up and called it Parliament. <laughs> that you can make a sitcom called the aristocrats. Yeah, that that comes from the uh, English common law revolution. You know, with the levelers and all that. Oh yeah, when we tried to the. Make a republic Win fail. Win Stanley. I've read a lot of Win Stanley. You know, like it's it's sort of you know archaic, you know, and, and written in sort of your theocratic language, but it's still sort of interesting, you know, how it presents concepts. I support the breakup of Britain, but I do have the eighteen hundreds um, draw up for the Republican flag desktop screen. Unfortunately, Hungary now has the same flag, so <laughs> we, we can use that one. Oh wow! Okay. I guess we've gone on too long for people to uh, continue uh, listening to us, but I think that we've touched uh, a lot of things that are important. So let's do it again, okay? Oh yeah, I, this would be a great discussion to continue on. Okay, okay. So good evening to you. And good evening to you as well, my friend. And Thank uh, you. it's been great speaking with you, and I hope everyone enjoys the video. Yes. Yes.